Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's learn about system design for web crawler. Web crawler is also called as spider, spider bot, in short it is called as crawler. Web crawler is a framework or a tool or a software which is basically is used to collect the web pages which is available in the internet and then save it in a specific way which is easily accessible. It is also called as web indexing. This tool basically goes to some of the reference pages which were uh, initially provided and from there it keeps on saves those pages and also finds the URLs available in that pages and then keeps going uh, through other uh, web pages and keeps on doing the same things recursively. Now let's understand what are the different kind of web crawlers are there and then what are their applications. So here are the list of uh, different kind of web crawlers available um, in the internet and you can build uh, one web crawler for yourself uh, for your purpose. But generally people build web crawler for one of these use cases. Uh, the first one is search engine as you know there are like um, two three famous search engines like Google or DuckDuckGo or you know Microsoft's Bing, Yahoo as such all of they have their own web crawler so basically when you search from google.com um, they find a relevant page among all the pages which they have collected. The second one is uh, copyright violation um, detection so this is basically to find um, you know copyright violated content which is there in the internet. Say for example you are an artist and you have a mp3 file um, which you uh, basically composed it but maybe some guys are uh, using it without your permission. This tool basically helps you to find that content, who is it using it and then you can basically send a notice or sue them. So basically that's one of the use case. The next one is keyword based finding say for example these tools can be used also uh, say for example you are interested in some kind of um, content maybe you are interested in share market uh, so basically these tools will be keep on collecting the information about the share market and then uh, keep showing the what's happening um, what is the news or the latest news about the share market so something like that so web malware detection Again, it is used to find the malware uh, in the web, um, different websites. Uh, maybe it's phishing attack, maybe you have a site, say for example Gmail, someone has hosted a similar web page in somewhere and then you basically need to find it. Um, so something like these kind of use cases. So the next thing is web analytics and this is, is used basically by some of the companies and you know data scientists uh, basically to characterize the different content and the dynamics of the web application. Um, the next thing is also a little bit similar basically to collect the data which is required to train the machine learning models. So now let's talk about what are the features we want to support in our crawler. So the first one is politeness or also it's a similar feature called as crawl rate or you know bandwidth protection. Uh, the next one is DNS query, the other one is distributed crawling. We can't just have one box which basically crawls, we can, we should be having the capability in our design to add as many boxes or the servers we want uh, to scale it up. So the next one is priority crawling, obviously we have to have a priority of which site to crawl. And the next one is duplicate detection in which we have it's a very important feature for a lot of um, application because we need to detect the duplication and then we need to not to crawl those sites. So as usual let's understand the scale of uh, the web pages we want to crawl uh, using this crawler. So consider there are about 900 million registered websites uh, in this internet. So out of which not all the websites are not actually up or might be configured to deliver some pages. So let's consider on a best case 60% of the uh, registered websites are functional and that comes to about 500 million websites we need to crawl. So we need to see how many pages are there in each website. So we can't just count it like that. So let's take an average number. Um, some sites will be having one or two pages. Some sites have 1000 pages. Let's keep 100 pages on an average in each site. So it would give, give us like around 500 million into 100 pages. So around 50 billion pages we might need to crawl. This is the number of pages we are planning to crawl and that's the scale um, we need to build the crawler for. And also the size matters, right? Because we are also planning to save the uh, each and every pages in our storage. We have to calculate the average size of the page. So you might go to you know inspect elements uh, and then go to network tab and then the bottom 
place where you can see the total size of the page for any given website but that is the total amount of web page uh, the total amount of downloaded content but that's not true in case of uh, crawler because we are only crawling the main page or index page we are not going to download all the images and all the you know uh, static content all of that stuff except maybe css maybe js and css uh, because we need to render um, uh, to get the actual page because most of the pages uh, these days are single page apps uh, we need to render it still but we don't need to download the images so the size of the page will still remain less um, you need to calculate you need to take account uh, the size of the very first page which we hit it um, like as shown in this picture so that would give us 120 kilobytes on an average um, so that would give us you know six petabyte of uh, size or a storage required to save all of these pages might be you know even more one or two petabytes up or down uh, but uh, this is the number on an average add two petabytes extra uh, like that so I mean it's also a good idea to compress once we process it because we don't always refer to that page if it was a search engine maybe we will take out the metadata information like uh, we build the inverted index and then it's done right we don't need the complete page um, of the content uh, maybe when we access the Google cached page that's when we need to serve that um, that time we can unzip it and then we can show it and here we have the system design diagram for the crawler which actually supports all of the architectural goals which we just discussed and uh, to start with I have to start explaining from here this is where all of the magic happens the seed URLs uh, what does seed URLs means is the uh, initiator URLs for any crawlers to crawl it needs to go to some site uh, to keep on fetching the URLs in that page and then keep crawling and keep crawling right so we need to provide some of the seed URLs to start with so the ideal strategy is to is uh, from all the different sectors like education entertainment travel uh, blog um, and 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 finance so collect all the top hundred sites and then feed it to uh, make a list of it and then uh, have it as a seed URL and then push it into URL Frontier. So URL Frontier is the data structure which actually uh, is built using queues which actually gives the uh, priority and politeness features built in. So I'm going to talk this briefly in after a couple of minutes but for now you just think it as a queue. Uh, so whenever someone asks to give the next priority URL to crawl it basically gives the URL. So just remember that for now. So seed URL, you know, frontier. Now the fetchers and the render. So this is this is where all the magic happens. This is where all the data is fetched. So what are these? These are basically implemented using either threads or processes or anything basically which gives concurrency. I mean, most likely threads is the one, right? But if you're using Python, uh, you can actually use async IO, which gives even better performance when it is making IO operations. Um, so for now, let's take it as thread. Uh, we can scale these fetchers and renderer, uh, basically both component into one. Uh, so both of the components are built into uh, you know one worker itself. Uh, so call it as workers for now. Uh, which actually has fetcher and then renderer uh, we can scale this uh, like as many numbers we want by adding more and more machines each machines will have more threads so we can scale it to any number of you know threads we want to uh, it all depends on how much uh, parallelization we have to do uh, so it, it includes two components one is fetching and one is rendering fetching as the name itself suggests it basically gets the requested uh, gets the content of the url basically it, it does the curl or request dot get or post based on the http method so how does it start so so these workers actually are threads right so whenever a thread is free it is going to ask url frontier to provide a url to crawl it's that simple okay so when the thread asks url frontier it provides a url okay you have to crawl this URL. Now, what the f what the worker will does is it basically start to fetch it. So before fetching uh, the actual content of the um, URL, it has to do some stuff. What are those? Is basically the DNS resolution. Uh, why do we have a DNS resolver? Because 
if you just do the curl, we basically get the content, right? The resolution and all happens automatically, but why do we need the DNS resolver? Uh, there are a couple of reasons why, because if we don't have our own custom resolvers, it usually takes a lot of time uh, to resolve because uh, in a, uh, the ideal way is like, um, first we will check in operating system and then we will check it in the you know, browser cache and then we will check it in the ISP and then it goes on different hops, right? It takes a lot of time. To cut down the time spent on DNS resolution, we, uh, we can implement our own DNS resolver. I'm not going to talk about how, but um, we, that's for one more session. So we need our own custom DNS resolver where we can just ask the DNS resolver to map, uh, provide the IP address of the host name, so it basically gives us. Um, one more thing is, uh, most likely the, um, the native library which comes along with the operating system for the DNS resolution is mostly synchronous. Uh, that causes some problems even though we have multi-threaded uh, environment uh, in a machine. That module, the DNS module basically is, is like a synchronous way or single threaded. So all the threads are blocked because of that thread. Uh, so basically think it this way, to make it more efficient DNS resolution, we need a custom DNS resolver. So the fetcher basically gets the IP address of the host name we are going to fetch. Um, and then using that IP address and the path, it is going to fetch uh, the page from the internet. So once we have the content, uh, what we have to do? Uh, the content, we can't just directly use it. Like earlier days, uh, we never had Angular or React.js um, like uh, JS frameworks, right? So it used to be page which has the content already in it. Uh, once, once we do, you know, processing of that page, like removing the tags and everything, we used to get the content itself. Um, but now it's not the same way we do it because we use um, front-end MEC pattern, uh, like um, uh, single page applications where a lot of content will be downloaded uh, asynchronously or by Ajax. So that's the reason why we can't just uh, fetch the content and process on top of it. We'll have to render it also. We have to do server-side rendering. Uh, there are a couple of libraries which gives the server-side rendering capabilities like uh, Next.js or Gatsby. You can use the, those uh, renderers, provide the content, it basically renders using the JavaScript. Basically, it executes the JavaScript um, on the server-side and it does all the Ajax call and uh, loads the page uh, so we have the complete page available. Um, there are optimization uh, these days people are doing. Uh, the index page, they do server-side rendering from their side itself so we don't need to do uh, from here, but anyway, we have to do the render uh, rendering and then check um, if the page is complete. Then, uh, most likely, our work is finished. And one more thing the fetcher should do is set the user agent to appropriate, uh, you know, crawling um, company name or something like. Google sets it to Google hyphen something as a user agent, and uh, similarly, Yandex and other Bing uh, DuckDuckGo sets it to its own user agent. Uh, the advantage is so that the website admins can configure the servers to behave a little bit differently for the search engine itself. So that's one thing. And uh, the next thing is once they, once the uh, executors um, fetch the content and render it, the final thing is they need to cache it um, or the save it uh, into the persistent storage in here and also cache it in the Redis uh, for two reasons. Persistent storage, we might compress and store it, so it will be a uh, little difficult for other processes to fetch it uh, and compress it's like time consuming. So that's the reason why we need to cache it as well for some duration uh, so that the, uh, the processes will take that web page and do some analysis on top of it. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. So once, once the executor fetches a uh, response, the next thing they need to do is add a message here pointing to the response which we have saved in the Redis. So, as of now, in this design, we have two processes here. We can have more number of processes here. It's like one is URL extractor, that is kind of default processor we need to because we need to keep on crawling from one page to another page with all of the links which we find there. Like uh, other processing is duplicate detection. The one more thing which we can do is like uh, you know, malware detection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what uh, we get the extensibility um, uh, feature where you can add more processors. Every processor which we add receives that message, uh, copy of message for everyone, and then they do their own processing. Um, since Redis is faster, fetching the content from here is fa also faster. 
um, because it's in memory. So we get the page, we process it, and save the result wherever you want. It could be database or it could be whatever. whatever. So, so the next thing we need to know is URL extractor. What it does is, as the name indicates, its work is to extract the URL from the page which we just um, got or crawled it. Um, so, so what does it mean? Basically, we will find a lot of URLs uh, like this picture. Um, uh, this web page has a lot of links in this page itself. So it could be pointing to the same website or it could be pointing to the different uh, website or it could be pointing to the same website's different subdomain. All of this we need to do some pre-processing over here while extracting the URLs itself. Maybe sometimes um, some URLs might be pointing to uh, the same page with a permalink. Then in that case, we don't need that link to be uh, recrawled it again because it's essentially pointing to the same page itself. Um, sometimes, uh, yeah, what are the URL normalization we need to do? For, uh, the first thing is we need to uh, point all of the subdomains of the same website to this. Uh, we need to map it to the same uh, domain. Say, for example, um, blog.google.com. Uh, mail.google.com, maybe uh, you know keep.google.com. All of these subdomains uh, are actually essentially part of Google itself. So we need to tag all of these subdom subdomains into uh, same website called google.com. So that's one thing. And the next thing is we need to uh, you know append or append the backslash uh, to the end of the URL to make it a standard URL format. Um, and the next thing is um, we might need to append. Uh, HTTP protocol uh, if it is missing and then one more thing is um, uh, yeah, lowercase or uppercase say say some sites will have the URLs uppercased um, so we'll have to make it a standard convention of uh, converting it to a lowercase uh, so these kind of normal URL, URL normalization we need to do and then we get a set of unique URLs we got it from that page which we just crawled all of that URLs should be passed next to the URL filter. So what does URL filter do? So URL filter um, actually is dependent on the characteristic of the crawler which we are trying to build. So if you are trying to build a crawler which crawls only uh, the MP3s, then that means the URL filters only filters the MP3 URLs or the links to MP3s only. If you are trying to build a crawler which only fetches the HTML pages, that means that this filter uh, should filter all of the URLs by MIME type. So it could be by applying the regex, uh, by checking the uh, you know extension in the end of the URL. Maybe if any URL contains .mp3, .mp4, or .dot um, any format, right? So .dot jpeg. So we we are not really interested in those kind of URLs. We don't need to crawl further to those uh, pages and then. Uh, do some processing because essentially they are pointing to some kind of media. So we had to remove all of those URLs and keep the URLs which we think they are HTML. So that's what the URL filter does by checking the MIME type and the URL rejects pattern. So once we do the URL filtering, so we have the unique URLs uh, in our hand. Um, so those are essentially kind of like a HTML pages only. Now what we have to do. So the next thing is also crucial thing. So we need to check uh, whether that URLs are already crawled or do we have those URLs in our system. So how do we check it? Maybe we have a list of URL for a given domain. Say google.com, we have a list of dom uh, all the URLs which we crawled. Say blog.google.com slash a lot of blogs, uh, list of URLs. So it could be like enormous, right? It could be like so many URLs. Like how do you check whether this URL is already in the list or crawled or as such? So Search is always a difficult thing, so it could take order of n, uh, so that's bad. So for that, definitely you will be using Bloom filter. Uh, so you need to use Bloom filter here. So using the Bloom filter, it's a probabilistic data structure, so it means that it's not always right. When it says no, this URL is not present, it's always 100% sure. When it says yes, that might be the case. Uh, it is like. The, some probability it might be wrong, but it's fine that even if we miss some URLs because um, the next time we might encounter the same URL, uh, we never know. So basically we use the Bloom filter to make it more efficient to check whether that URL is crawled. If that URL is already crawled, then we don't need to include that uh, for the further processing, drop it. Otherwise, um, keep carrying the list of URLs we got it. So what URL loader does is, it is always also a good idea to save all of the URLs which we crawled for a given domain. So 
you can either save it into a database like NoSQL or you can append all of the URLs which you crawled uh, for a domain in a file and put it into HDFS like a distributed file system to um, save them. So basically it's, it's, it's just a mapping of domain to all of the URLs which you have crawled. Uh, that's one thing. So we can save it if you want. It all depends again on the use cases. Um, let's think, okay, we are saving it. We are saving it to, into a file. Say the file name is google.com and then all of the URLs which we crawled is inside this file. Maybe this is like uh, uh, so techcrunch.com and all of the URLs from the techcrunch which we crawled is kind of appended and saved into a distributed file system. So we have all the list of URLs from any given domain. Um, and now also we need to forward those URLs uh, which the unique URLs which we got from the crawl next to the URL frontier. So if you look at the system diagram, the URL frontier is the one who actually gives out the URL to the threads to you know, crawl. So that means that the URL frontier is kind of responsible to handle the priority uh, of the URL and also to handle the politeness. That means that um, the priority which also gives the meaning of how to, uh, when to recrawl and also the freshness of the page. So if it is a new site that means that we have to keep on crawling every now and then, like every five minute ones or maybe every 10 minute ones or every one hour ones. That means that uh, for the news sites or the websites which serves the news content, the priority is really high. And also uh, we need to implement the politeness. That means that we shouldn't be overwhelming the server or we have to always ensure that only one connection is always established from the crawler uh, to the server of a given host. And also there should be um, a delay between each and every calls to that particular host. So all of these features uh, to provide, uh, we can't just use one queue and then some kind of priority priority queue and then we can implement. So, so this is the design uh, we have to use uh, to support both priority and also the politeness. So how does this work? Um, I'm going to explain the different components now um, and then we go through the complete working of this uh, data structure. So there are two sub modules to it. The first one is front queues and the uh, back queues um, and all of this is what the URL frontier is. We have the prioritizer here and then we have the back queue router. We have heaps and uh, we have back queue selector and we have the uh, table to map all of them and then we have the threads. These are the fetchers and renders, the threads which basically ask the URL. So if you remember from the system diagram, right? So basically uh, the back queue selector will give the URL to fetch. Okay, so now what does this front queue means? The front queue is also a simple FIFO, like first in, first out queue. Uh, there are like F number of queues, which is up to us. What is F? Is the maximum number of uh, front queues, uh, which is equivalent to the maximum uh, priority we have to assign. Maybe like, okay, I, I decide that I want priorities from one to thousand, so I'll be having thousand queues, um, thousand front queues. So this will be, thousand. That means this is the first queue, second queue and this is the thousandth queue. Okay. Now what this contains? This contains the URLs. That's it. Like nothing much fancy about it. It contains the URLs. It could be mixed of URLs. Um, say there could be one tech crunch, one digit, one something something or there could be number of tech crunches one, some digit, some uh, CNN, something like that. Uh, it's, it's a mixture. The higher priority the URL, um, it goes to the higher number um, and it's all up to prioritizer to decide what priority we should give to that URL. Uh, how do we decide which URL gets what priority? It all depends on the historical uh, information which we have when we are crawling. Uh, so we have to analyze the historical um, information like how frequently the page of a site was changing. Say for example, um, one site was changing the content every one hour once, that means that it most likely that it is like a high priority site, we have to keep crawling. There could be some sites uh, which are like host a lot of static content. That means that when I crawl today and when I crawl tomorrow also the content on the URL is not changing. That means that these sites can be of low priority. We can crawl it uh, really slow with, uh, with a lot of, with more delay or crawl once in a week or something like that. But the new sites, definitely we should crawl once in a hour or something like so the higher priority goes to those kind of URLs. 
Um, it all depends on the how frequently the content changes on the on any given host or a website or a URL. So so now we can map a URL uh, to the priority. Now the prioritizer with the information it has uh, the historical information, it can prioritize and then push it to whatever uh, priority keys it it wants to. So now we have URLs here. Now what happens? Now we have the back queue router here. The back queue router's job is to ensure none of the back queues are empty. So whenever a uh, back queue, this is also first in first out, okay? And um, there will be like one to B number of back queues, which is equivalent to the number of threads which are there in the fetcher, okay? The total number of threads should be equal to the number of back queues which we have in the URL frontier. Um, so now this, back queue router always makes sh make sure that none of the back queues are empty. How does it know? It keeps on monitoring the queues and its size. Whenever a URL, whenever a queue is empty, it basically pulls from the higher priority queues uh, and then pushes it here. There are chances that these queues might be empty because we pulled a lot of URLs from the higher priority one. These are allowed to be empty, um, but not these ones. Um, so the back queue router will pull the higher priority uh, URLs and put it into these um, queues. Here, one important thing is a queue will be designated to one and only one host or one and only one website. That means that we can't have the queue named after a website. Instead, we have the queue number and in the table, we'll have to map those, uh, you know, queue number to the host name. Um, this keeps on changes as in uh, keeps on this host name to the mapping of the back queue will keep on changes as in when we see a different kind of set of URLs. Maybe uh, within an hour we finished all the crawling of digit.com. That means that this will go away. If there is something uh, new host is coming, maybe like hbo.com, in that case this will be replaced with hbo.com and assigned it to the queue ID fifth. That means that all the URLs uh, belongs to the hbo.com will be in the fifth queue. Okay, uh, that means in any queue there will be uh, URLs which will there will be always URLs which belongs to the same website. Okay, that's one more criteria. Why do we need to do uh, that? The important thing you need to uh, remember is politeness. Means we don't want to um, make tons of calls to the same website uh, to fetch the information, right? Because we need to make um, call one by one. That means that for hbo.com, if I fetch one um, page from page now at time t1, um, that that means that the next call should happen after t1 with some delay only. We can't have parallel calls to hbo.com. That's why we need to put it in the queue so we get the ordering of, uh, uh, of the same of the URLs of the same host name. So we can uh, easily implement the politeness. Uh, but here, we are more worried about the priority. So we implement the priority here. We implement the politeness here. We mix all of them to implement politeness uh, and priority. So priority pulled it, put it into politeness queues, and then we have the politeness implemented here. So now how it works, let's take an example. Yeah, let, let's take an example from that side. So. Now the fetcher is uh, free. That means that a thread is free to crawl a website. What it does is it asks the back queue selector, give me a URL. I just want a URL. Uh, give me one, I'll crawl it. The back queue selector, what it does is it goes to heap and then checks what is the URL or what is the queue from which I should pull a URL and then give it to the fetcher. How does it know? Um, there will be uh, one to B entries in the heap that is equivalent to the number of back queues. Uh, why do we need to have a heap is because uh, in the heap we can get the min heap, um, we can get the min minimum value in log n time, right? That's the reason why we have heap here. Uh, what it contains is basically, I'm going to write somewhere here. So I'm going to write here. So if, say, say consider we only have four heaps. Uh, for for Q, so the heap will basically have um, something like four only four um, element in it. Um, so now what happens is we have to every time, so every time the back queue um, 
selector fetches a URL from heap, it basically checks uh, entry. So we'll, we'll be having entry from one, two, three, and four. A entry which has the minimum time in it. Say, um, the minimum time represents when to fetch it or how early to fetch it. So say this is like fetch at minute one, fetch at uh, minute three, minute two, and minute four. So that means that whenever the back queue selector looks at the, uh, take, take a look at heap, that means that it gets to know, okay, now I need to go to Q1 uh, because uh, at time one, it, uh, it, it has to go to Q1 and get a URL and then crawl it. Um, so what it does is it gets one, Q ID one, it goes here. So there could be N number of URLs in it. It just fetches uh, it just pulls one URL and gives it to the fetcher. What happens to the next one? One more thread comes back uh, to the back queue selector and then asks for one more URL. So by then, the, this has already elapsed. By then it gets this one. It means it tells, okay, go to Q2 and then take a URL and then give it to the thread. Um, now, once the thread fetches that URL, that page, it has to update the heap back. So once it finishes, it, it also tells that back queue, I have finished this. Means initially we fetched one, right? It, it updates the time uh, of this one uh, to maybe seven, because we, we just now fetched it. So now let's fetch um, whatever the URL, uh, which is there at one, at seventh time. At one, maybe a tech crunch, right? So uh, we, we hit a, we requested the techcrunch.com with some URL at time one and then at time seven, right? That means that we are doing it, we're not doing it parallel. We are doing it one after one, okay? We have, we have given about six minutes of delay of between one call to one more call. That means we are kind of implementing the politeness. So heapify it, we get the minimum number at the tops in that node. Uh, we keep on plucking it. So the next, when we do it, we get this one. Uh, meanwhile, if the thread two finishes it, it updates this value to something else, maybe 10, um, something like that. So this is used to know which queue is the queue we need from which I need to pluck the URL based on the minimum time, um, the upcoming time at which we have to uh, fetch it. Sometimes it might happen that uh, there are no URLs to be fetched right now. In that case, most likely the threads will be halted. Um, so. The, the key is how much delay we give between the calls. I mean, it's okay to not to give delay or, as well because we made a call to hba.com. We can immediately make a call once that call finishes. The first call finishes, it, the second call can be started. So we don't need to give a delay. Uh, it's just that we need to track the times to make sure that there are no two parallel calls going into a same host name. Um, maybe we completely fetched all the URLs in the techcrunch.com, that means that back queue router will know that, okay, techcrunch.com tech finished it, so it gets the next priority queue which, is, which has a lot of URLs, it fills in and then updates the table and, and everything keeps on working the way it was supposed to be. Um, the only key criteria of this is, as I mentioned, it should be always non-empty and uh, one queue per thread and one queue per host only. At no time, we should have mixed, you know, heterogeneous uh, URLs um, inside a host, uh, you know, back queue. That means that this is always designated, say, one is always TechCrunch. This means this queue only can contain URLs from TechCrunch.com. The fifth queue, uh, maybe in the middle, will always contain only the URLs from Digit.com. The 19th queue uh, should always contain only URLs from the YouTube.com. Uh, once it becomes empty, the back queue router will fill from a different URL and change that to a new host name. Um, and the next important thing we need to understand is how to detect updates and how to detect duplicates. So why do we need to detect updates? Because uh, we have to, we should know how frequently the data in a page is getting changed or data in a website is getting changed. That way we can adjust the crawl rate or how frequently to crawl that site. So for that, we need to keep on uh, checking how frequently the updates to the page is happening. So how do we do that? Do we need to completely fetch the page or is there any other strategy? One strategy such is instead of downloading the entire content, we can make a head request. In the head request, we'll basically get the last modified time. If the mo last modified time which we got by the head request and the previous crawled 
are same, that means that the page has not modified. So we don't need to actually download the whole content. So that way we can uh, detect the updates by doing a head request. So that's the easiest way to detect the updates. Now the interesting thing is detecting the duplicates. And why do we need to detect the duplicates? It, the statistics shows that about 30% of the pages in the internet are like duplicates. So that means that we save 30% of storage space, we save 30% of processing time and everything, right? So, so that's why it's, it's much important to detect the duplicate pages or duplicate URLs which are pointing to the same document, all of that sort of stuff. And also the important thing is there are a lot of spammers who, who steal your content from your blog and then post it on their blogs to earn money by advertisements or for, for, for anything, okay? So we need to detect that duplicates for that reason also and identify which is the legitimate page and then, um, and then crawl only those pages, okay? So how do we detect the duplicates now? There are uh, so many strategies to do it. The simplest way is brute force method where you basically check every word in the page to the other pages word, but it's not so efficient because we have about 50 billion pages to be crawled. That means that in our storage, we have 50 billion pages. Now, anytime when you crawl a page, you can't literally go back to 50 billion pages and check each and every words. It takes ages to do it. So definitely brute force method is not possible. The next thing is hashing. Hashing is like you get a unique um, hash for a page. It's like a signature, right? So you have two pages. So how do we make sure that these two are duplicate or not? So when you compute the MD5 or SHA1 or whatever, so in that case, we get some hash, something like A1, B1, two, something like that. So next, do the same thing. Uh, basically, whenever you're processing, as a processor, you can add this as well, like, um, like hash calculator or something or since we have the duplicate detection module, so that we'll be doing that part. Basically, uh, every time when we fetch a page, we also calculate the signature and store it in our storage uh, as a file name itself. Um, so that would be easier. So we just need to check for the repeating signature, okay? Uh, like you compute, you compute hash uh, of same um, algorithm like MD5 for other page, and then if you get the same hash, maybe, you get a different hash. That means that they are not of the same page. Uh, if you get the same hash, that means that clearly both are duplicate copies. That means that you, you can drop some of the URLs uh, so that you save a lot of processing and space. But things might happen this way. Not always every word in the page is same. This signature logic only works if the page is very identical to the every character. But when people copy, they don't copy entire site. Sometimes they only copy the content and then place it in their site. The characters will be totally different uh, because of HTML tags or some other content which is there in the page. So, so this is also not promising. Uh, so signature calculation is also not promising. So there are other set of algorithms which gives you the probability uh, listic matching or near, uh, what do you call that? Uh, we call it as a near duplicate um, search. Um, it's like even though some words are missing or some percentage of words are different, we still categorize it as a, as a duplicate content. Uh, there we can set a threshold as such. Um, like algorithms like minhash, simhash, fuzzy search, uh, you know, latent semantic indexing, and the other one is standard Boolean uh, model. We can use any of these algorithms to do the near um, match documents. Uh, so one such algorithm which Google uses is SimHash. Um, I mean, you know, the, the way this algorithm works is, you know, much um, simpler. And it's easy to uh, do calculate on, on the page also. Like, it's so easy. Uh, maybe I can show, in one, show one example. The advantage of SimHash is uh, the SimHash signature, uh, the SimHash signature will be same even though certain percentage of the document is different which means that most likely uh, if 80 percent of the words are there in both the documents that means that we can classify it as near uh, you know matching document so how does this simhash algorithm work uh, so before uh, processing the document through simhash algorithm we need to do you know basic cleaning stuff like removing the stop words uh, or lemmatization uh, you know stemming all of that stuff so so we only end up 
the article content, uh, not the HTML tags, all the CSS stuff and everything is removed. We only have the paragraph or the article content. Say for example, in our content, we have the words like, um, so we have Apple, there, there are two words with Apple. Uh, there is one word with laptop and one word with swim. So let's take a very simple example. In our article, we only have uh, four words two times Apple, one time laptop, and one time, one time SIM. What we need to do is, we need to calculate a binary hash for this. So when we compute the hash, so binary, maybe we got, for example, say one zero one one. For this guy, maybe one one zero zero. For, for SIM, maybe we got zero zero zero. So what this algorithm says is, um, so we need to replace all the zeros with minus one, okay? Uh, and then we also need to multiply the frequency with the hash. Say this, this means that the frequency is two, and here it's one, and here it's one. So, so all these words, So, uh, all these words and their binary hash should be arranged in a tabular or columnar format and then we need to multiply with the frequency. Now, when I multiply, what happens here is, so it will become 2, 2 and 2 and replace all the zeros with minus 1. Okay, so, so replace all the zeros with minus one, replace all the zeros with minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Now we need to sum the columns. Uh, we need to basically do a summation of the columns. Now what happens, the value is four, this one is minus one, and this one is zero, and this one is zero. So the unique signature with the sim hash is four minus one and zero zero. So if you calculate um, um, the other document sim hash as well, even if certain percentage of the words are different, the, the signature will still be almost similar. That way we can detect the uh, you know duplicate pages uh, when we are crawling. So if, if it is duplicate, we can blacklist those URLs and the host name. We don't need to crawl that site at all. And the next thing we need to discuss was how do we store all of the pages which we just crawled? Um, so where do we store it? So do we store it in a database, a relational database or NoSQL? Uh, relational database, definitely no. NoSQL we can try, uh, but the only worrying thing is what if the pages are in MB, sizes in MB? So that's also not so efficient. Um, you can go ahead and store it in uh, Cassandra or somewhere um, the blob as a convert into blob and store it in the uh, as a row but that's not advisable so the other alternatives are you, if you are building in Amazon platform or somewhere you can easily use Amazon's um, S3 uh, simple storage solutions um, or the open source alternative of Amazon S3 min.io which is written in Go which is also looks uh, promising you can deploy it on your cluster and then you can use that as well um, apart from that Google actually uses Bigtable. Um, it has its own uh, Google file system underneath. Uh, it is either using Bigtable or GFS for storing all of the pages which it crawled. Uh, so whenever you access the cached page, uh, the page is actually coming from uh, GFS file system. Uh, but Bigtable, I think, uh, underneath it uses GFS itself. Um, so similarly, you can go for HDFS, the Hadoop distributed file system. The only problem is the block size is uh, either, it's, it can be configured, but it is um, advised to have about 64 to 128 MB block size. Um, MB, it's like 64 MB even if it is. Um, the HDF is not really, uh, HDFS doesn't really work well with small f sized files. So, so this is also not kind of that advice to use HDFS. The one more alternative of HDFS is available, which is HDFS Federation. Um, as I have read, I think this looks promising to save 
um, you know, small files. Uh, I'm not sure because I haven't tried it out. Uh, but definitely these um, file system will definitely help you. Uh, these are like any distributed file system, the Gluster FS, OrangeFS and ExtremeFS, but they have their limits of uh, the upper limits. So in that case, maybe we'll have to think about sharding uh, um, because the GlusterFS, I believe it works up to some couple of terabytes, uh, maybe 100 terabytes or something. I, I don't know the exact number, but they have their limitation. They, they doesn't perform well after certain certain limit. In that case, maybe we'll have to have a sharded way of uh, file systems and then maybe like um, have a consistent hashing uh, with, a, with a file system and distribute all of your um, content in the file system using uh, consistent hashing. I mean, you can, you can try solving all of this problem. Um, so use any one of these systems uh, which, which will help you to store the raw files of HTML as it is uh, with some metadata also if you want. I guess I have uh, covered the most important uh, features and how to implement and how to how they work, uh, which is related to uh, distributed crawler. Um, definitely the design is much similar uh, how Google, Spider, and Yahoo's uh, um, uh, crawler works. Uh, this is what I was able to get from their white papers. Um, so I guess this will be of a real helpful for you guys to answer in any of the interviews, uh, if not for the interviews, for in general, to understand how to build systems like this. One request, so please subscribe to the channel and, and spread the word, uh, tell your friends to subscribe to Tech Dummies. Um, thank you. <laughs>